Church, there are two exciting events coming up in the life of this church in the next month, uh, next month and a half. Crossing Paths, a wonderful church-wide retreat, or for many of our members, a day, an afternoon. Uh, that is coming up March 6th and 7th. So, uh, I don't know how, 12, 10, 12 years we've been doing this event. It's out in Pryor, Oklahoma. Dry Gulch, USA, wonderful facility. Uh, there's more information, and you'll be hearing more about this via the website, videos, handouts, brochures are available uh, out in our foyer, all three campuses. This is going to be a neat year. It's going to be the first year where Crossing Paths has been really about the business of Jinx, Brookside, Central, Iglesia de Cristo, our deaf ministry, all coming together. Uh, if you're like, man, that's a month away, that's a big event, I see there's some cost involved, I encourage you to come out for Saturday, and most of all, more than me encouraging you, I encourage you to pray about it. Uh, look and see what the Spirit's saying to you about getting involved in the lives of others. It's going to be a powerful event. The other event coming up March 28th, our Jinx campus is leading us in Park Plaza's first 5K run, all right? Now, this is going to be something. Or should I say for some of us, our first 5K walk. That's what I'll be doing, okay? It's called the Kibo Run. It's going to be an event that introduces Park Plaza more and more to the South Tulsa, Jinx, Sepulpa, and Glenpool community. But it's also an event that is about the business of bringing clean water to Africa and us bringing the word of the Lord, the living water, to Africa. We're really excited about this because it started off small. It's already made the Oklahoma... Uh, Mary Margaret told me this just at a meeting on Friday morning at 8 o'clock at a Starbucks. And I'm not a big runner guy at all, but I, Mary Margaret is. There are 10 races that are to be done if you are a runner in the state of Oklahoma. This race has never happened before, but they like the slant of helping others so much through this race this 5k has already made the top 10 races that you've got to be about if you're a runner in the state of Oklahoma and so now guys from Oklahoma City, Lawton, Muskogee all around the state are coming over because they want to do all 10 races so keep that run we need people to pray about it we need people to show up and support we need volunteers they're building an African village there and they want the runners as they run through this race to look around and see here's what the water wells look like that you're contributing to here's the community and what their cooking habits look like that you're helping to bring about into a way that blesses others so keep those events crossing paths and the Kibo run in your prayers well if you've got your Bibles please be turned to Jonah chapter 3 we'll be there in just a minute by way of reminder uh, as we're in this series on Jonah, and I think it's a great correlation with sowing for eternity, Jonah, this were reluctant missionary that God brings into a place of bringing about a great, great revival through Jonah's work and the Word of God going through him. We're in our third week. We're mindful that Jonah chapter 1 was a story of Jonah running from God. Jonah chapter 2 last week, He's in the belly of this big fish. He's not running from God anymore. He's now trying to run as hard as he can to God. God, if you would help me out now, all I want to be about is your work. And in chapter 3, it's broken up really nicely. So we've got a guy running from God, a guy running to God. And now the exhilarating business and example of a gentleman, a follower of God, who is now following God and he's running with God. And so we begin to read together in Jonah chapter 3. Let's read verse 1 and 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh, this great city of 120,000 people, true metropolis, massive city in the time of this writing. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Boy, if you're having deja vu here, there's a good reason for it. This is the exact same message that God gave to Jonah in chapter 1. But you remember in chapter 1, Jonah doesn't obey God. He fakes like he's got bad cell coverage. Hey, uh, God, God, you're breaking up on me. We haven't talked about what an evil and wicked city that Nineveh was. We're going to get to that next week. But 
Jonah is one where God says, I want you to go to Nineveh, and he goes the exact opposite place. He goes as far and as fast as he can, so to speak, to get out of God's cell coverage. He doesn't like this message. He wants another message. We're clear that in 2 Kings, Jonah up until this point had been a prophet that had delivered God's word. But he doesn't want anything to do with it in chapter 1. But now a second time this word of the Lord comes to Jonah and the result is completely different. This time Jonah acts in a way, and I propose to you this morning, I believe that it is the greatest revival in the entire Old Testament. You've got the most wicked and evil city that the Old Testament ever talks about and you have the most drastic change that we ever see save the resurrection of Christ in the New Testament. It may be the most drastic change you see in the entire Bible. And so we begin to explore how God's Word works through us when we listen to His voice. And so our first point this morning is this. Life is good when I am hearing God. Life is good when I am listening to God's Word. Oh, the blessings that are in store for those who strive to make time in their daily walk to hear a word from the Lord. And you say, Mitch, I'm nothing like Jonah. When God speaks to me through His Word, when God speaks, as the Bible says, and instructs me in my dreams... When God speaks to me, as the Bible says, through those who have the gift of teaching, I don't go as far and as fast as I can from the Lord. But many of us suffer from another ailment. We may not geographically go as far and as fast from the Lord as we can, but our lives may be too full for the Lord to truly speak to us as often and as deeply as He would like. The past two days I've got to spend time with my favorite author. His name is Dr. Kenneth Boa. Flew in from Atlanta. Many of us blessed to feast on the Word of God through him. And one thing that he said really caught my attention. He's a part of a study from the Center of Biblical Studies in which they have done a massive undertaking in looking at 40,000, not 4,000, 40,000 individuals who profess to be Christians, and profess to read the Word of God, and they took a look at how the Word of God in their lives, through reading the Word of God, through hearing God's Word, changed their lives. And what they expected to see was guys who didn't read the Word of God had no discernible difference in their life. Okay, I'm a God follower, I read God's Word, yeah, I say that, but I really don't. And that guy would have no discernible difference in his life from someone who was a professed atheist. And that's pretty much true. But what they expected to see is as a guy or a gal spent time in God's Word, it would begin to differentiate. They would begin to look, hey, I read God's Word once a week. He looks a little bit different than a guy who doesn't spend time in God's Word. I I read God's Word uh, twice a week. He looks a little bit different, and so on. And what they found was this, and this was interesting, and they're still looking for the reasons for this. You read the Word of God once a week, No discernible difference. Twice a week, no discernible difference. There's no ramp. There's no integration of things going up. Three times a week, no discernible difference. Four times a week, that was a number. Quantum leap. The line looks like this. One time a week, twice a week, three times a week. If you read the Word of God, you go, where is this in the Bible? This isn't so much in the Bible. This is a study I'm talking about. Four times a week, quantum leap all they can figure out is seven days in a week this guy is spending the majority of the week four out of seven days reading God's Word are we people where our lives again we're not talking about Jonah moving fast and far but are our lives so full that we are not spending four times a week or more in God's Word let us be people who take God at his word Psalm 46 and 10 says this Be still and know that I am God. You remember what this is an allusion to. You say, well, Psalms 46 and 10 is an allusion to to what again, Mitch? This is an allusion to coming out of Egypt. 
This is an illusion at being there at the sea. And you've discovered that Pharaoh, who said you can go, has now changed his mind and is coming with an army. Not a good place to be when you're not an army. What do you do? This is real problems. And this is where we live today. Mitch, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I'm between a great sea and an army that's coming to get me. I've got to act. I've got to do. I've got to be busy. I've got to do things in my life. And Psalm 46 and 10 says, that is all well and good, but first off, do this. Be still. That's what Moses said to the Israelites. And get ready to know that He is God. We have demands on our lives. We have pressures on our lives. We have army of responsibilities coming after us in our lives. And all that is before us is a place of, I can't move forward. I have to do things and God gets squeezed out. And God is telling us today, life is good when I am hearing God's word. There's a second point that comes from chapter 3 of Jonah and it's this. Life is better when I am heeding God's word. This word heed is falling out of use in our culture today. The Webster's Dictionary defines heed as this, to take notice of, to take notice in the direction of one, or to act upon that which has been heard. Jonah, in chapter 1, he heard God's word. That's good. But what is better is when we not only hear God's word, But we heed God's word. We obey it. We act upon it. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 3 says this. Jonah heeded. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. And then, different from chapter 1, he went to Nineveh. You know, there's been a new disorder that has been discovered recently. It's called selective auditory attention disorder. I have it, and it is my belief that many of the men in this room have it. What this disorder is described as in my home plays out like this. I'm watching the Patriots and the Seahawks. I could care less about these two teams. And my wife behind me begins to tell me that the front door needs to be painted. I honestly do not hear her at all. I have selective, honey, don't be mad at me, I have a disorder. Selective auditory attention disorder. It's not my fault. It's something that's been passed down to me. But they found a cure, ladies, and it goes like this. It's not a medication. Open up with the painting the door with this. Honey, would you like a bowl of ice cream? Yes, I would. I love a bowl of ice cream. Great, then go paint the front door. That's how it works, okay? You begin to get across the message that you really want to get across. There are times with the Lord that I have selective, auditory, attention, disorder. I wait for a message that I want to hear. It is great to hear God's Word. It is better to be someone who hears and then heeds God's Word. James chapter 1 and 22 says this. James is uh, the wisdom literature of the New Testament. Do not merely listen to the Word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This morning I love to give you the A, B, C's and even throw on a D of what it is to be about the business of heeding and obeying God's word. Letter A, let's let God get our full attention. Let us remember that God comes in chapter 1 of our life and he tries to get our attention. But when he doesn't get our attention and he knows his plans are best, sometimes there's a chapter 2 in our lives where we spend time in the belly of a big fish, so to speak. And so then he's got to send us into chapter 3. One of the lessons of the book of Jonah is do what he says in chapter 1. Listen to the Lord. Let him have your full attention. And in fact, as we continue to move on in the A, B, C's and even D of heeding and obeying God's word, I don't want to just look at Jonah this morning. Probably our better example of heeding the Lord is not looking at Jonah this morning. It's looking at the people of Nineveh. They're the ones who really hear, and in a miraculous fashion, immediately heed and obey what God is saying. And so this morning, read with me please in Jonah chapter 3, 
verse 4 and 5. On the first day, now Jonah gets it now. He doesn't go on the second day or the third day. He's been in the fish. He understands what it is to have the Lord and give Him your full attention. So Jonah, on the first day, he starts into the city and he proclaims just eight words. In Hebrews, in the Hebrew language, in fact, it's just six words. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Modern day translation, if Mitch had been there, you got a little bit more than a month and it's about to be lights out for you, Nineveh. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. Let her be in obeying God. Once he has our attention and once we have full ears to what he is saying to us, let us be believe what God says. It's one thing to believe in God. It's another thing to believe God. And I submit to you this this morning. Now, did you catch that? There are many Christians who believe in God. But when it comes to directions for marriage, when it comes to directions for sex, when it comes to directions on how they should give their money, oh, they believe in God, but they don't believe God. I submit to you this morning that if you don't believe God and heed His Word and do what it says, you are, James 1 and 22, deceiving yourself. And if you don't believe God, sooner or later, you will no longer believe in God. Because there is a discrepancy between your belief and your walk, and one of those will eventually fracture and give way. So let us be people who, like the Ninevites, hear the Word of the Lord, 40 more days and it's going to be lights out and they believe the Lord. When the Lord tells us how to give and be generous, let us not just hear that word. Let us heed to that word. Let us believe it. It's what's best for us. When he tells us about instructions for our marriage, when he talks to us about sharing our faith, when he talks to us about staying in his word, let us heed his instruction and follow after his teaching. Amen, church? Jonah chapter 3 and 5, as we move on to letter C, says this. The Ninevites, they declared a fast. I love this. Here's the revival. 120,000. Any preacher would have been happy with most evil people on the earth. I walked in and I preached a six-word sermon. Eight words in English. 10,000 responded. Are you kidding me? Jeremiah preached his whole life and almost no one responded. He preached chapters, eight words. You're telling me I can go to my neighbor and say eight words and they'll respond to the Lord. You'd be like, that's a fabulous revival. That is not what we read about here in Jonah 3 and 5 of 10,000 responding out of 120,000. What we see in God's word is they declared a fast and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Can you imagine a guy walking into the middle of America, getting on social media, getting on some network and saying eight words, and the next word said, 331 million Americans said, this is it. We believe God. I mean, it would be a revival where we would be going, what's going on here? Looking, You'd see pictures of Donald Trump walking around in sackcloth. Over in Los Angeles, Kim Kardashian, sackcloth. Up in Seattle, Pete Carroll. Well, he's already got on sackcloth. But anyway, uh, you know, he's got on sackcloth. And it says all of them, from the greatest, the most well-known, to the least. You go by any preschool. Two-year-olds, sackcloth. How's your sackcloth? Mine's great. I'm having a blast, you know. All of them respond to the word of the Lord. What is this in heeding God's word? Number one, we let him get our attention. B, we believe what he says. And Mitch, what's this sackcloth business? That's the way they confessed back then. That's the way they confessed outwardly of saying, we've blown it. We have messed it up royally and we want to come back to the Lord with everything we've got. 
This morning, if you have been one who has been hearing God's word, but you have not been heeding what he has been saying with your dating life, with your relationship life, with your financial life, with your spiritual life, be one today who says, God, you have my attention. Maybe God's had you, not so much in the belly of a big fish, but he's had you between a rock and a hard place. And today is a day where you begin to believe what he's saying and you come and confess. And you say, Lord, your ways are right. Mitch, I want to do everything but the confession part. I kind of want to keep this on the inside. That's not the biblical anatomy of coming back to the Lord. That is not the biblical recipe for a revival in your life. It is very clear in God's word. This is what it is to come to the Lord. Now, I want to read to you about the most important step. Read with me. We'll read the rest of the chapter. Jonah chapter 3. Let's begin in verse 6. So the greatest of least are walking around in sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, sat down in the dust, then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king of the nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had planned or that he had threatened. Letter D, we read about a drastic change. It is not enough for God to have your attention. It is not enough to believe. It is not enough to confess, God, I have been wrong. Let us be people who make a drastic change. The Word of God says they gave up their violent ways. Who knows, maybe if we change, God will change His plans for us. Here's the stark, here is the stark sobering, jump up in your face thing of this biblical narrative. Nineveh, had they ever seen one miracle? Nope. Had they ever heard the word of God once before? Nope. How many times had they heard the word of God? Once, six words. And what do they do? We follow you, Lord. We follow you. Every one of us follows you. Israel, a thousand years of prophets, kings, Moses, miracles. Miracles? miracles upon miracles and what are they doing Eh, i'm kind of lukewarm we follow you every once in a while drastic change brothers and sisters let me tell you something about following christ don't look at other christians don't be conformed by what they're doing Well, well they're kind of changing you look to jesus christ you look to the cross you look to what he gave And when you look to that, that's when the drastic change comes. I kind of want to be like the church down the street. That's not our model. That's not the one we're called to turn our eyes to. You turn your eyes upon Jesus, and that's when the drastic change kicks in. That's when we become the disciples we're called to be. In closing this morning, there's someone who's saying, So Mitch, I'm to hear God's word. That's when life is good. Life is better when I heed God's word. And Mitch, I know that the Bible is full of telling Christians, stop this, stop that, stop this, stop that. Mm -mm. That is in there. But the most often given command to the God follower is not stop that, but go there. We are called to be a people, and especially in the season of sowing for eternity, that understand that life is good when we hear God. Life is better when we heed God. But number three, life is best 
when we are heading out for God. It is not about just stopping something. There is a place for that. There is a revival when we stop our sinful ways. But we are not just people who are called to stop something. We are called, as Abraham was in Genesis 12, to go, as Christ called us in Matthew 28, to go to the ends of the earth. Life is best when we are acting like Jesus and we are heading out for God. Heading out of our comfort zones to share our faith. Heading out of our routines to express love to a stranger. Heading out of our busy schedules to express love to a wife, a husband, or a child. Heading out of our old ways on Sunday mornings and signing up to teach the class. Heading out and going on the mission trip. Heading out and asking this question, not only who is my Nineveh, but who is my neighbor? I wanted to show you a video this morning that perhaps many of you have already seen. In the middle of this video, a friendship is formed. Neighbors are found. But there's a line in this video that says, The man they waved to, but hardly knew from the house next door, became their dearest friend. Are you catching that? Their dearest friend, who was waiting to be that, was the man next door that they waved to, next door neighbor, but they hardly knew him at all. This morning, indulge me, share with me, and let us share together as we watch this video together. Emmett Richner is three, going on four, and for no particular reason, he is driving with his eyes closed, which would not appear to be going particularly well. Fortunately, Emmett has a mentor. I got a bagger that fits on the back. Erling Kingdom is 89, going on 90. Like this. Uh -huh. And this has been going on. <laughs> Ready, set, go! For nearly a year. <laughs> Emmett's parents had to laugh. He blocked me out. The first time they saw their preschool racing a man who fought in the Second World War. I told you he was fast. I'm super fast. You want to play croquet? Which stick are you going to have? The man they'd waved to, but barely knew. Watch this, Erling. From the house. Oh, right through. Next door. Boom! They're together pretty much every day. Did you find a worm? Nope, it's a, it's a bug. Emmett first crossed into Erling's yard when he caught a glimpse See these yellow flowers? of his favorite food. These are going to be tomatoes. Every time he saw me out there, he would come running over. Erling, got any tomatoes? <laughs> Can you throw a baseball in there? Every day. Erling can't see so good. A new adventure. Oh. We saw Erling over working on this bike that looked like it was from you know, the 60s. <laughs> and I thought, there's no way he's going to get on this bike. And he did. It took him a couple times to get on his bike. And I thought, am I going to have to call 911? Please don't fall over. Anika Richner wondered if okay. so warm a friendship you want to play Star Wars with these? would survive the winter. One day I looked out the window and I took this picture because it was just so cute. He was snow blowing a path from his back door straight to our back door <laughs> so they could visit. Yep. You know what this is from? Mm -mm. It's from Erling. Where's the fish pool? He likes to show him things and draw him pictures and explain. So I can learn about how fishing works. He's just taught him so much. Which is why those tears um. have been coming more often. We decided back uh, a month ago to, to move. Brian Richner says their growing family simply needs more space. I love him. It is the hardest part about moving. Yeah, it's tough. And change. It's tough is coming uh, for Erling, too. Uh, yeah. When you think about it. Soon he'll be 90. Yeah. His wife is ill. And just days ago, Erling's kids finally convinced him it's time to trade his house and yard for a senior apartment. Erling, come over here. Till moving trucks roll. I can hear you. Goodbye. We'll have to wait. Put a washer on. This January, December, Friendship still has a bitter sweet 
July. We have been called to go to our neighbors. We have been called the people that we wave at, but we hardly know to go. I loved in that video when the little boy holds up the fishing instructions. This is how you catch a fish. We are called to go and live our lives in a way that give instructions to the world. We're called to go fishing, church. Jonah shared eight words. I've got eight words for you this morning. I'd love for you to come to church. Would you like to study the Bible sometime? Jonah learned the lesson to never underestimate what eight words could do. Maybe your eight words will start in your own home this week where you tell a spouse, under eight words, I love being married to you. Maybe it'll be going to a parent who hasn't heard, even from an adult child, in a long time. You go to your dad. You go to your mom. You tell them that you love them. Maybe it's that person that you need to seek forgiveness from. Short sermons, will you forgive me? Maybe it's someone you need to give forgiveness to, and you go to them and you say, I forgive you. Would you like to have lunch? Never underestimate the small words. It is good to hear God's word. It is better to heed God's word. But it is by far best to head out in living out God's word. How is God calling you today back to be one who believes, confesses, and makes a drastic change in your life? Does he have your attention? There's one that's coming this morning already. In just a few moments, we will witness Dylan give his life to Christ in baptism. Maybe today's the day you join him and you make a drastic change. Would you come now, if we can pray for you in any way, as we stand and as we sing.